The first rule, which is kind of a comical rule, is stand up straight with your shoulders back. And it's a meditation, among other things, on the habits of lobsters. I read some papers on lobsters about, must be 10 years ago, I guess, and it, they just absolutely blew me away. And one of the things I've really loved about being a psychologist, and there's many things, but I've really loved psychoanalytic theory and, and the great clinicians, the behaviorists as well. I mean, Freud, Jung, Adler, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, uh, the behaviorists like Skinner and, and, and the cognitive behaviorists. I mean, I've learned a tremendous amount from reading the clinicians. And so if any of you are interested in psychology, I would really recommend reading the great clinicians because they know, they, you learn so much about life, it's crazy if, by reading them. So that's been fun. But then on the entirely other end of the spectrum where I've learned most about psychology is from the really low, uh, what would you call them, the, the really science-oriented animal behaviorists. That's where, who they turned into the neuroscientists, right? They were the animal behaviorists, first of all, and then they turned into the neuroscientists. And I've learned a tremendous amount from them. They're such clear thinkers. Uh, the best of the bunch, I think, there's two of them. One named Jeffrey Gray, who wrote a book called The Neuropsychology of Anxiety, which is just a deadly book. It's impossible to read. It takes like six months to read it, because I think he, he read like 1,800 papers to write it or something like that. And he actually read them. That's the cool thing. And he understood them, which is really something. And then there's another guy named Jak Panksepp who wrote a book called Affective Neuroscience, which outlines his studies, for example, of rats. He was the guy who, who learned that rats laugh if you tickle them with the end of a pencil eraser, but they laugh ultrasonically like bats. So you have to, sl you have to slow down the ultrasonic vo vocalization before you can hear them giggle. And you think, why the hell would you spend your time tickling rats with a pencil and making them laugh? But see, what he demonstrated there was that, that there was a play circuit in mammals, that there's an actual, there's a psychobiological basis for rough and tumble play, for example. It's a bloody big deal, you know, discovering a whole new circuit in the brain. That's like discovering a continent. It's Nobel Prize winning stuff. And Panksepp's Affective Neuroscience, I would highly recommend that. So. Um, there's this other book I know about too, which is 12 Rules for Life, which you could also look into if you want. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I was reading these, these articles on lobsters and I, I, I came across this, this finding that lobsters, lobsters governed their postural flexion with serotonin. And I thought, God, that's so interesting. It's so interesting. Flexion is this, is to stand up straight. Eh? Wow, that's so interesting because, you know, depressed people crouch over. I wonder if there's any link between those two things. And then I went and read a whole pile of papers on lobster and lo lobster neurochemistry. Lobster neurochemistry is actually quite well understood because they have a fairly simple nervous system, right? And, and so if you want to understand a complex nervous system, it's a good idea to understand a simple one first and then sort of elaborate upwards. And it turns out that um, serotonin governs status, uh, it governs status, emotional regulation, and posture in lobsters, just like it does in human beings. And so that would just blew me away. And so one, one, one thing that, that chapter one is about is the fact that if a lobster is defeated in a dominance battle, you can give it essentially antidepressants, and it will fight again. And that just blew me away. You know, it's so, it's so remarkable, because one of the things it tells you is that, so if you're a, de imagine that you could be, lobster, top dog or bottom dog. Imagine there's 10 strata in the lobster hierarchy. And so you could be number one, right, top lobster, number 10, bottom lobster. If you're bottom lobster, you have low serotonin levels and high octopamine levels. That's a neurochemical that human beings don't produce. And if you're a top lobster, you have high serotonin levels and low octopamine levels. And you can move a lobster in its dominance hierarchy by m moderating its levels of serotonin. And I thought, that's so interesting, because what it means is that the counter that keeps track of our status, and we have a, a counter, in a sense, in our minds that keeps track of our status, is a third of a billion years old. And what that also means is that the, the, the idea of the hierarchy, let's call it a dominance hierarchy, because it, within lobsters it's, it's kind of like a physical prowess hierarchy, something like that. The idea of the hierarchy is at least 350 million years old. And so I read that and I think, well, so much for the idea that human hierarchies are a sociocultural construct. It's like, no, that's wrong. It's not just a little bit wrong, it's unbelievably wrong. It's mind-bogglingly wrong, right? And it's, right, and so, 
so hierarchies, hierarchies have been around for a third of a billion years, and, and we have a neurochemical system that modulates our, our understanding of those hierarchies. And then also, and this is the interesting thing too, and this is why people's reputations are so important to them, um, among, there's lots of reasons, but this is one of them, is that where this counter that you share with lobsters rates you in terms of your hierarchical position determines the ratio of negative emotion to positive emotion that you feel. And that's also an absolutely mind-boggling idea for two reasons. One is it tells you why it's so hard on people to be put down. Because it doesn't just upset them in the moment, it changes the way their entire system responds to the world so that they now experience more positive emotion and less, than ne less negative emotion. So that's really rough. And then there's a corollary to that too, which is like, huh, there's a very tight relationship between your belief system and your dominance hierarchy position. It's complicated, but it's worth going through. Like, let's say that, so I have a certain amount of status as a professor, and, 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 and I have the, let's call it the, uh, the, what would you say, I've been granted the entitlement to a certain position in a, in a social hierarchy. Now, the question is, why do I have a valid claim to that position? And the answer, hypothetically, is because I know enough so that my claim to the position is valid. So then if you stand up in the audience and challenge my beliefs and show that I'm wrong, you might, you might say, well, I get upset because I'm wrong, but the more accurate reason that I get upset is because you're indicating to the crowd that my, my position in the hierarchy of authority is invalid. And by doing that, you lower me in the hierarchy and you mess around with the neurochemical systems that are regulating my emotions. And so if you're interested, at least in part, in why people are so prone to defend themselves and their beliefs in the service of their position, then that's why. And so that's a great example of how you can learn these unbelievable things by stumbling across a rather obscure biological fact. It just, it just what would you say? It, it's, like a, it's like a series of dominoes. And, and that's also why biological facts are so useful. It's like, we don't have to argue about whether or not ho ho social hierarchies, as I said, are, are, or hierarchies are social constructs. A given hierarchy is influenced in its structure by sociocultural conditioning, let's say, but the fact of the hierarchy, so like the part of your brain that detects and regulates your response to hierarchies is older than the part of your brain that recognizes trees. Like it's old. It's really, really fundamental. And so, and almost all social animals organize themselves in social, in hierarchies, because now, the other thing that chapter one is, is a bit of a meditation on what might constitute a hierarchy. One of my business colleagues, a former student of mine from Harvard, very, very smart guy, he's got a graduate degree in engineering from MIT and a, a PhD in psychology from Harvard, so there's like one of him in the whole world. And he's a very smart guy. And uh, he helped me design the self-authoring suite, by the way, and he's been working for about 20 years on that. Um, that's a suite of programs that helps people write about their lives and straighten them out. He told me to stop using the word dominance hierarchy. And he said the reason for that was that it was infested with Marxist presuppositions. And it really bothered me when he first said that, because I'd been using the word for years, dominance hierarchy. He said, we had a discussion about that. He said, well, it's predicated on the idea that you climb up the hierarchy human hierarchy as a consequence of the expression of power. It's like, that's wrong. You climb up valid hierarchies as a consequence of the expression of competence. And that's actually technically right. He was exactly the right person to tell me that because he had done his PhD on what predicts success in Western hierarchies. And the answer is quite clear. General cognitive ability, some prefrontal ability as well, which was what he spe specifically tested. So intelligence, roughly speaking, although it's a little bit more elaborate than intelligence, but that's close enough. And trait conscientiousness accounts for about 50% of the variance in long-term success. And you think, well, hey, how do you want your society to be structured? It seems pretty good to me that smart, hard-working people are the ones most likely to succeed. That's not a bad empirical test of the validity of a structure. You know, especially given how much vagary there is in life. Lots of random things happen to people. But it's better to be born three standard deviations above the mean in intelligence in the West than it is to be born three standard deviations above the mean in wealth in relationship to where you'll end up when you're 40. So he said to use the word competence hierarchy, or we decided that. And I think that's much better. So chapter one is a bit of a meditation on the nature of hierarchies and the biochemistry of hierarchy, but it's also an injunction about how to present yourself, because you don't, you want to present yourself to the world in a manner that, 
that doesn't disgrace you in some sense. That, that might be a good way to think about it. And you don't want to disgrace yourself because the consequence of disgrace is, is emotional dysregulation. More pain, less positive emotion. And so the best way to present yourself is to stand up forthrightly and to stretch out, you know, and to occupy some space. And to, to, to you, you make yourself sort of vulnerable by doing that because you open up the front of your body, right? But it's a sign of confidence. And that way people are most likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. And that's a good way to start regulating your mood. But not only does it directly regulate your mood to stand up, because it's so tightly associated, like posture reflection is associated with serotonin and emotional regulation, but also because if you straighten up and you present yourself in that manner, then other people are more likely to take you seriously. And that means they'll start treating you as if you're a number one lobster instead of a number ten lobster. And that's another way that you can at least give yourself the bloody benefit of the doubt, right? And, 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 and confront the world in a courageous manner. And that's a really good way of also of, of figuring out how to establish yourself in multiple competence hierarchies, because one of the general rules of thumb about how to be successful is to confront things that frighten you forthrightly and with courage. And that's kind of a universal strategy for success. And so that's what the first chapter is about. So that's quite fun. My graduate students, I told them these lobster stories. Hey, my graduate students, when we used to go out for breakfast, and they were a very competitive bunch, very fractious and witty. And they were always trying to get one over on each other, eh? And making some witty put down or something like that. And it got to the point in the restaurants where they put their claws in the air and click like this when they, you know, <laughs> got one over on one of their colleagues, which was very peculiar and, and strange and, and very funny as well. So. So that's rule number one.